Okay, so welcome back to this next video in which we are discussing lipoproteins and the transportation of lipids around the body. Okay, right. So, we're just in the process of discussing the different types of lipid molecule. Okay, so we've seen triglycerides, we've now seen phospholipids, which are these uh, structures based on the structure of phosphatidic acid. Okay, so they have a glycerol backbone, hence the glycero in their name. They have two long chain carboxylic acids, and they then have a phosphate group attached to uh, the third uh, carbon's alcohol group of the glycerol molecule. Okay, and then also attached to the phosphate group, you then have some group which can vary. And the main example of a phosphoglycerolipid that we're going to be concerned with in this video is phosphatidylcholine PC, also called lecithin. Okay, right. So all phosphoglycerolipids are considered phospholipids because they have two fatty acids, so two long chain carboxylic acids are within their structure, and they also have a phosphate group. However, they are not the only form of phospholipids, okay? There are other types of phospholipids, and we're going to talk about these now. So basically, there is a vast... Um, repertoire of lipids which are all grouped into the category of sphingolipids. Okay, right. So basically sphingolipids are based on the structure of a molecule called sphingosine, which I'll draw here. Okay, now I'm just going to draw a cartoon for it, which means I'm going to draw a line and then colour it in red rather than give you its full chemical structure because it will take too long to discuss the full chemical structure. And for our purposes, it doesn't really matter what the full chemical structure is. Okay, so what you need to know about sphingosine is that it's a very long molecule. It's 18 carbons long, okay, and it has a hydrophobic tail. At the top, you have a few more interesting groups, such as alcohol groups, amino groups. You even have a double bond at one point, but the tail of it is extremely hydrophobic. It just looks, you know, like the tail of a uh, stearic acid molecule. Okay, right. Uh, now, basically, to create a sphingolipid, what you do is you start by creating something called a ceramide. Okay, so the first thing to say is that sphingosine is a set molecule. Okay, so there's one sphingosine molecule. Okay, there are different optical and stereoisomers of it, uh, but it is one molecule, okay? It's not like the triacylglycerols where you don't even know what the long chain carboxylic acids are. This is a molecule where I can draw the structural formula out for you exactly, okay? Now, what we're going to create is a type of molecule known as a ceramide. And basically, to create a ceramide, what you do is you link a long chain carboxylic acid or a fatty acid off one of the important groups at the uh, head of the sphingosine molecule. If you're interested, it's specifically off the amino group that the sphingosine molecule has. Okay, so it's actually linked via an amide bond here. So we have our long chain carboxylic acid here. So this is a fatty acid linked via an amide link onto the sphingosine molecule. Okay, ooh, not fatty acids, fatty acid. Okay, now that creates you a type of molecule called a ceramide. Okay, and once again, just like there is not just one triacylglycerol or not just one uh, phosphatidic acid, there is not just one ceramide uh, because you can have many different fatty acids here. Okay, now, to go from a ceramide to a sphingolipid, what you then need to do is add on a special group onto the top of the molecule. So the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule has an alcohol group coming off it, and this can have special extra additional groups added on. Okay, now, when you do that, you create what's known as a sphingolipid. So basically, the step-ups go like this. You go from sphingosine to a ceramide, and then you can take a ceramide and convert it into a sphingolipid. Okay, right. We are going to be interested in a certain type of sphingolipid, okay, known as sphingomyelins. 
and basically these are where you have put in a certain group onto that first carbon's alcohol group and one of the things that these sphingomyelins all have in common is that they have a phosphate group put onto that uh, first carbon's alcohol group okay and then usually they have another group then added on top of that and for instance an example that you can have is choline so this is exactly analogous to what we saw in the case of the phosphoglycerolipids where you had the phosphate group first linked to the alcohol group of a glycerol molecule and then you had the other alcohol group of the phosphate group linked via a phosphoester link to another uh, group basically Okay, so the sphingomyelins are very analogous to the phosphoglycerolipids. Okay, so you have a phosphate group first, and then you can have another group here. Okay, and one example would be a choline group here, and that would create you a sphingomyelin. Now, these structures, these sphingomyelins, are also considered phospholipids. Okay, and we can now understand exactly why they satisfy the criterion for being considered phospholipids. They have a long chain carboxylic acid within their structure and they also have this phosphate group and that's all you need in order to be considered a phospholipid. Okay, now I want to stress that sphingomyelins are just one of the types of sphingolipids. You don't have to attach a phosphate group here. For instance, you can attach uh, carbohydrate structures here and get different types of sphingolipids that are not sphingomyelins. But when you put a phosphate group here and then another group on top of that, for example, choline, that's called a sphingomyelin. And uh, these are important components of the phospholipid by there, okay? They're also extremely important in the myelin sheath that surrounds neurons, hence why they are called sphingomyelins. Okay, right. Now, we have now seen all of the types of phospholipids. We have seen the phosphoglycerolipids, which, remember, uh, have this sort of structure, where you had the glycerol molecule with two long chain carboxylic acids is sterified to it, a phosphate group of the third uh, carbons alcohol group of the glycerol molecule, and then an additional group attached to the spare alcohol group of the phosphate group here, such as choline, for example. Okay. And we've also seen these sphingomyelins, which basically are based on sphingosine. They then have a long chain carboxylic acid attached to them, and then they have a phosphate group attached to their head, and then an additional group such as choline attached to that phosphate group. Okay. These actually have very similar structures, because if you look at this, we have two very long tails here, which are extremely hydrophobic. The sphingosine tail is extremely hydrophobic. The long chain fatty acid tail is extremely hydrophobic. On this molecule, we also have two long hydrophobic tails. Okay, we then have a little portion here, uh, which is the interesting portion of sphingosine, which is analogous to the glycerol in the uh, phosphoglycerolipid here. You then have a phosphate group attached to the first carbon of the sphingosine molecule, which is analogous to this carbon of the glycerol molecule, and then you have an extra group added on here. This is why phospholipids are often drawn like so. Okay, This drawing takes account of both of these different types of phospholipids. You have the long tails here, which are very hydrophobic, and those are in both cases, both in the uh, sphingomyelin case and also the phosphoglycerolipid case. And then you have the polar head here. So something that I haven't really dwelt on yet is the fact that these head groups that we've got here they are quite polar. The phosphate group and the uh, additional groups, such as choline, that we've got added on here, they are both polar. They're not neutral. For instance, if we look back at the structure of the phosphate group and the choline, the phosphate group has this oxygen here, which has a negative charge. So the phosphate group is charged. It's very, very polar. Then we've got uh, lecithin here, uh, so, oh, sorry, choline here, okay, uh, which has this positively charged nitrogen on its end. So it's polar as well. 
So basically, at the tips of these molecules, you have a polar region. Now, this polar region will interact well with water, whilst these hydrophobic neutral tails here, those will not interact well with water. Okay, right. And uh, this is the well, these structures are the basis for the phospholipid bilayer of all cells, okay? So, the cell membrane of all cells and also other membranes within the cell, for instance, the nuclear envelope, the membranes of the intracellular organelles, all membranes that the cell uses are basically lipid bilayers or phospholipid bilayers. And basically, it consists of loads and loads of phosphoglycerolipids with also these sphingomyelins, okay, so it's just phospholipid after phospholipid after phospholipid, but hopefully you can now appreciate that there is a huge diversity of different phospholipids within the phospholipid bilayer. We've got all the different sphingomyelins that you can dream up, we've got loads of different phosphoglycerolipids, and all of them are considered phospholipids. And basically, the idea is that their polar heads face out uh, towards the water, which is within the extracellular fluid and the cytoplasm, whilst the hydrophobic tails face inwards and interact with each other, basically. So they're nicely tucked away from the water molecules, basically. Okay, so... That's now phospholipids finished, and we've now finished sphingolipids. We're not going to care about other sphingolipids other than the sphingomyelins, which are considered phospholipids. Okay, right. Uh, what we're now going to move on to is discussing cholesterol, which is a very important topic when we're discussing lipoproteins. Okay, so... Uh, let's start with the structure of a free cholesterol molecule, and then we'll talk about cholesterol esters. Okay, so basically, cholesterol is a sterol, and sterols are modified steroid structures. So let's start off with the structure of a steroid. Okay, so basically, this is a common misconception. People often think that steroids uh, are defined biologically, basically, i.e. they're defined by their biological activity. They are molecules which have some incredible biological activity. But in actual fact, steroids are chemically defined. They're defined by a chemical structure that they all have. Okay, so let me show you this chemical structure. And the chemical structure of steroids is absolutely always drawn in skeletal formula rather than molecular formula. Because if we draw them with their skeletal formula, then they actually have incredibly simple structures. Okay, so we can draw beautifully simple pictures. Whereas if we draw their molecular formula, they look like a total nightmare. Okay, so we're using skeletal formulae, which means that we don't show carbon atoms. They are implicitly shown by corners um, and meeting points of, of bonds. And uh, we don't show hydrogen atoms which come off carbon atoms. Wherever you have uh, carbon atoms which don't have enough bonds, you can assume that the remaining spare bonds are to hydrogen atoms. So let me now show you the structure of a steroid molecule. So basically, all steroid molecules have this sort of a structure within them. They have these four rings joined together. A six-membered ring, another six-membered ring, a third six-membered ring, and then a five-membered ring right on the end, like so. So, uh, this is the characteristic structure that all steroids have. So, what's well, why it looks so simple is because... Basically, it's just carbon and hydrogen. That's all that makes up a steroid molecule, at least a pure steroid molecule. Of course, the important steroids don't look like this. They have additional bits added on. Okay, so they have a slightly more interesting structure than this. But, for instance, if we take a carbon like this one here, in actual fact, of course, you will have two additional hydrogens coming off this, because at the moment, I've only got it going to two other carbons, one here and the other here. It needs needs two additional bonds, so we we'll actually have two hydrogens coming off. Uh, but of course we don't show those because we're doing drawing a skeletal formula, which is why this structure looks so simple. Okay, right. So, let's firstly turn this steroid into a sterol. So we can do that very easily. Basically, you take one of the hydrogens off this carbon and you replace it with an alcohol group, like so. So that's how you convert a steroid into a sterol. You just add an alcohol group down here.
okay? Then, to make specifically cholesterol, what you do is you put a methyl group of this carbon and this carbon, okay? So each of those carbons originally had three bonds to other carbons, and therefore had a single hydrogen coming off. Now we've taken those single hydrogens off, and we've attached methyl groups on. Okay, uh, then you also have a double bond between this carbon and this carbon. Okay, and then finally, a little side group off up here. Okay, and this is a seven-membered, well, seven-carbon side group here. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And then you additionally have a methyl group coming off the sixth carbon over here, which is nicely symmetrical. I mean, it looks quite kind of cool the way it does that. Okay, so this is the structure of cholesterol. Okay, right. So this is a free cholesterol molecule. What I now want to show you is uh, how you can create what are known as cholesterol esters. Okay, so basically, uh, cholesterol is often transported around the blood rather as the free cholesterol. It's instead usually transported as cholesterol esters. And basically, what you do to convert a free cholesterol molecule into a cholesterol ester is you bring along some long chain uh, carboxylic acid. Okay, like so. So here's our long chain carboxylic acid. And again, it's not set in stone which long chain carboxylic acid you use. It just has to be some long chain carboxylic acid. And basically, what you're going to do is attach this long chain carboxylic acid to the alcohol group of the cholesterol molecule via an ester link. So the alcohol group of the carboxylic acid group is going to come off. The hydrogen of the alcohol group of the cholesterol molecule is going to come off. They will form water, and then the carbon of the carboxylic acid group will link to the oxygen of the alcohol group of the cholesterol molecule. And that will create you what is known as a cholesterol ester. Okay, right, because we have an ester uh, link between the cholesterol molecule and a long chain carboxylic acid. Okay, so we'll call it there for this video, and in the next video what we'll begin is our discussion of lipoproteins.